everybody. I'm KP, a no-code maker, builder, and the current program director at OnDeck No-Code Fellowship. And welcome to Building Public Podcast. So today with me, I have the co-founder and CEO of Morning Brew, the man, the myth, the legend, Alex Lieberman. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for having me. Pumped to be here. Awesome. So Alex and I are both unabashedly open about building in public and how big proponents we are about that movement. And, um, you know, when I thought of putting together a show uh, in 2021 to discuss uh, and have an open conversation around building in public, not just to be a, you know, one-sided, you know, view on it, to get a full 360, I, I figured Alex would be the best first guest. So um, I'm honored he, he agreed to be here. He also was kind enough to send me some morning brew swag along with, you know, um, Lo- loving the brew neck, loving the mug. You're, you're uh, repping it well. Right. Look, so uh, it's, it's almost impossible to get my wife to care about my day to day work. She's, she's not in no code, not in tech. But the moment she saw this drop by at her, um, you know, at her doorstep, she was thrilled because she's apparently a secret morning brew fan. <laughs> fan. And she was like so jealous that, uh, you know, you're getting swag. So uh, and that, now, of course, we need to send her stuff. <laughs> But yeah, thank you so much. So, um, well, well, I have I have um, a few things that I wanted to chat with you. I'm, I'm just gonna riff mostly, and like, like I said last night, uh, I, I I'm much more conversational about these things, and I wanted to be in an open floor and authentic, vulnerable conversation. I know that's your forte. So um, we're not gonna get into any formal intros. I'm gonna leave some show notes about your bio. And, Morning Brews, you know, cool. numbers in 2020, 2021. Um, but I want to start off with like, you know, if you re- if you recall, we had a tweet exchange a couple months ago um, where I tweeted at you and Dom from Fast, you know, at, about a few questions that I keep getting from uh, people on Twitter about building in public, you know. And um, you were kind enough to reply immediately and like, you know, sort of chime in with your responses. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. Well, for the first question, actually, let me, let me skip the order a little bit. Uh, for the co- first question, I wanted to ask you, when did you discover the magic of building in public? And did you even know at that moment the phrase building in public? Um, no, I didn't know the phrase building in public. Um, I think, I think... I've kind of been building in public actually for a long time uh, because I think there's a difference between like building in public to me isn't is platform or channel agnostic. So I think I've been building in public, telling people about what I'm doing, my successes, my failures in some format since starting Morning Brew in 2015. Like to me, right? Like we talk about building in public and we associate it with Twitter, but it really is anywhere, right? Right. It, 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 building in public is just the act of being vulnerable, the act of pulling back the curtain for people to see what's happening, what, what's happening behind, uh, kind of the brand. What, what, what is the machine that's allowing everything to be built? What are the emotions that a founder goes through? And so I think I've been doing that in some sense, talking about all of these things since starting the business. And I think for me, the reason that I've always done that is kind of twofold. One is from a, just like a a business perspective and one is a personal perspective. Like the personal perspective in me is, is I think my default setting is to overshare And, and that can be good and it can be bad, but I I have always been an oversharer and I think I do it honestly, almost as like a, a, uh, a shield or a mechanism of some sort where I think my philosophy has, has always been, if everyone knows everything about me, they're not going to have shit on me. Like that's right. kind of where it started. It was like, if I, if I can arm someone with all the information I know about myself, right. it's going to all be out in the open. It's right. all going to be talked about. And as long as I think I continue to act in my life according to my values, then there won't be things that I'm ashamed of doing. And so to me, it was always a way to like, to, to almost in a weird way for people who were like 
haters of me or people who wanted to find ways to to take jabs at what we were building in a weird way it was a way that i found uh strength in disarming them because if i give them all the information about myself that i know then it's almost like uh, you're a boxer and you don't give the, the, the person enough distance to throw a punch. So the punch can never land. Like right. that's, that's part of how it's the, I Muhammad, thought, it's the Muhammad Ali's like, you know, epic, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. And, and so I think that was the personal perspective is just give people all the information, like it, like show people there's literally nothing to hide and you have everything that I have. And I think the second piece of it from the business perspective is, over time, I just found more and more when I was being interviewed by people, when I was interviewing people, that people just wanted to know like the backstory and what's happening behind the scenes. Right. Behind the and, scenes. And, and and I think people like there's a reason that backstage passes at concerts sell for a shit ton of money. It's like people love being voyeuristic. They love being feeling like they uh, they are able to cut the line at the club when uh when it's around a club that they're really passionate about or uh, an artist at a concert that they're really passionate about and so i think this idea has been there for a while and i think i've just tried to think about how can i actually emulate that for people so that's one piece is like people like behind the scenes and the final piece is i think as much as you know mental health and things like therapy have been i would say less stigmatized in the last five years, I still think there's so much work to be done where people still feel incredibly uncomfortable with showing weakness, with talking about their mental health, with talking about the things that stress them out, that make them anxious, that make them feel weak. And I think there's so much opportunity there to to talk about it. And what I found for myself is while it was hard in the beginning, now it's like my default setting is to talk about some of the things that I suck suck at, the things that cause me uh, anxiety. Um, and, and that's kind of my hope is to unlock that for other people. So one of the, you know, side effects, um, of forcing yourself to, um, build in public or think about, um, you know, storytelling in public, you know, uh, is I, I, I think, you know, I wonder how you feel about this, but I think the amount of time that, you know, during the day that I pause once in a while, catch myself once in a while, um, has gone up. So the mindfulness side of this has gone up and I'm reflecting a lot, which is crazy. You know, and you could not, like I'm hyperactive. You could not get me to sit five minutes and do meditation, which I, anyway, I somehow like forcibly developed that habit, which is funny. But I think because now I'm thinking about like what have I learned in the last seven days, in the last 24 hours, you know, and it, it makes me reflect almost on default every day. Now how, how do you deal with this? Like, is this something you see? Yeah, I think it's a, a great point. And, and to me, this is, by the way, I think like the, the positive side of building public and sometimes the, the negative side of building personal brand. And what I mean by that is, I think the positive is to your point, it makes you hyper aware of all the things you do, but because what you realize is, all of the mundane shit that you do in a day that you find mundane, you realize other people won't find min- mundane. So from literally like us being on this Zoom and the stack of things that you used in order to record your first podcast to you know the act of me making coffee before this interview and my routine of when I'm going to grab my coffee in between meetings and why I made the decision to do so, like it sounds so non-needle moving but i think people find it interesting because it allows people to connect what what's obvious to you may not be obvious to millions of people and so my twitter game completely changed when i discovered that fact and i it turned into a playground i just i mean i know you do this too i literally just play i have fun on twitter i don't even care for numbers i don't even ever look at analytics you know so well for the for the for the fine folks who are listening to this I literally taught Alex Lieberman, the CEO of Morning Brew, something new this morning, which is I shared that there's this app called Grain. Shout out Grain.co. And he found out about it. And, and, and we're talking yeah. about this before starting the podcast. And I think there's something about, Alex, I know you have the same personality too around like, I'm hyper curious, right? Like every day, I don't care where the source of knowledge is coming from. I just want it, you know? So somebody teaching me something new, I get super excited. I immediately want to pass it on. 
And I, I bet you there's millions of people who haven't heard of X, Y, Z, you know, products, totally. or tools, or frameworks. Yeah. So and and I, I, what else is my point of view? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's a few things here. One is I think that in a lot of ways, I, um, I say that like my restless brain is both a gift and a curse. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I think it's a gift because my, I'm always thinking like, I'm always thinking of new ways to serve our users, new ideas of content we can create new things to create on social, like, and then totally different things from that. Like, you know, yesterday I was talking with, um, with Darren Ravel, who's been like a big sports name. Uh, and he, he was talking me through just like the boom that's happening in the memorabilia industry, like with, right. with, with sports cards, but like he collects all this other stuff. And my brain was going wild of like, is there a way to actually unlock memorabilia for companies? Like the first doorknob of the first Airbnb that was used. Can you actually, oh. can you actually turn that into an artifact that is you some kind of cruise you value? A picture of a photograph of Jeff Bezos working in this like yeah yeah happy looking room. I wonder if like yeah, any like, of those objects would be gold. Exactly. Exactly. Like like the door that he was working on as a desk or like the first Uber ride, could we like print out the, a receipt and get it signed by Travis Kalanick and the driver of the Uber at the time. So anyway, it's just like it, it's just fascinating thinking about just like new ways of thinking. I would say the 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 downside for me is you can't pick and choose when your brain is going to be on versus off or it's very difficult, right? That's where like mindfulness comes into it. And so I am just by nature, by design, a, a particularly anxious uh, person who has OCD and like that also eats away at me sometimes. And, and it's one of those things where it's like, it sucks because, you know, anyone who suffers from anxiety or OCD, like it's not an enjoyable experience, but it's also one of those things that I, I almost, I wouldn't just get rid of it because I love the way in which my brain operates uh, 90% of the time. And I do think there are things like mindfulness and exposure therapy and, and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that allow you to quiet your brain when you want to and get more control over it. Um, but I would say that's the, that is the double-edged sword of having uh, the always on brain. The right. one thing I was going to say about the the downside of like being hyper aware of your experience and understanding that every part of your experience is something interesting to mm -hmm. someone is that I will say like for me still, it is an absolute grind to focus myself outside of social media for extended periods of time. Like I, like I am addicted to Twitter and mm -hmm. it's not a good thing. Like, I think it's a good thing that I've shared openly on Twitter, but when it comes to discipline around it, I'm not super disciplined. And this is where, like I see one of the downsides of building in public is because there's endless amounts of content. It right. means there's like endless amounts of uh, opportunities in a day to right. go on Twitter and post and comment and reply and retweet. And I think for me, a balance there is something that I need to um, strike. You know, uh, it's so fascinating you mentioned that because, you know, Twitter is to me, uh, the way I look at Twitter is, is it's a learning academy. You know, it's, it's a free MBA. You know, I know you you have an MBA product uh, in the pipeline or you probably launched it. But uh, Twitter to me is like a free peer-to-peer -peer learning academy. You learn from the best minds in the world who are willing, willfully choosing their techniques and mindsets. But at the same time, it's the ultimate FOMO machine. If you uh, are someone who uh, likes to be everywhere, want to know everything, and want to do everything, right? Because there's so many CTAs floating around on Twitter. Like, yep. like you think about newsletters, there's like one CTA at the bottom and you're like, that's the conversion. But on yep. Twitter, everything is CTA. It's an engagement, you know, eggshell landmine, like everywhere. So you have to strike the balance, you're right. You know, and um, what, the technique that I, I use and has worked for me is dedicating, just like with email, 30, 40 minutes, set on my calendar saying that this is my intentional Twitter time where I'm going to produce. And every time I get like meeting breaks or whatever, I'm going to do reactions. Like somebody, somebody tags me and that's all like mindless, like just like simple reactions. But, but what do you, 
yeah. what do you do during the day when you're in a meeting and you have an idea for something that you want to uh, tweet? Uh, I put it, I actually have started to putting in my Apple notes. And then I, like I said, the 30 minute block that I have is when I yep. go to the notes and I put it out there. Sometimes I actually type it up in a new window in, in and then save as under, uh, save as a draft. Yep. Just, Makes sense. Twitter. Uh, but like, you're right. I mean, there's, it's an idea fountain, you know, and then, I'm actually shocked at the people who say that they, they don't have enough ideas to work on. I'm like, I have the opposite problem. I have too many ideas, especially with, with, with the no-code movement. You know that you can build an MVP with, for many of these ideas, you know, at least to a 90% accuracy of what you want. It blows your mind because you're like, oh my God, I can build this. Now I'm like super tempted, but you, you have to strike that balance. Um, all right. Okay, so moving, moving, moving through this, um, Okay, let's talk about the building public movement in general. And I know there's some so many amazing voices here. Um, who who are some people who inspired you in the past uh, about building in public before that thing was a was was taking off? Like, yeah. So OG I would say ten years ago. Uh, I I mean to be totally honest with you, I've only been on Twitter. I've only been active on Twitter it, in the last year. So like, I only really started tweeting in the beginning uh beginning to middle of 2020 before that i wasn't on twitter like i honestly what happened was um yeah, you, how were we <laughs> yeah it, it's it's wild that it wasn't part of my life before or and and um what happened was austin my co-founder he ended up on twitter i don't know what originally drove him to be on twitter but he he's a, he's a butter by the way like shout out like don't mind that man is a machine yeah no austin's austin's awesome and um he has amazing twitter humor like he his the way that he um leverages like just his wit and what i would call like his larry david humor like austin is the definition of dry humor it just lands so well can i ask you who hired toby because i feel like he's 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 in many ways then aligned with um, Austin's humor. Was it Austin? No. no so oh, what happened? What 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 happened was Toby was already on Twitter. He had like a hundred followers, what? and he was in. 100? What? Just yeah, 100? yeah, yeah, yeah. He had like a hundred followers. He wasn't at the company yet. He was in his first job out of school at a company, and I believe it was in Massachusetts. And he had followed, there were, he wanted to get into media. I believe he was following us. He was following Barstool and he was following, I think, Axios. And you, you, a lot of times, you know, when someone wants a job at your company, because it's when they start hyper engaging with people yep. at your company. Yep. So he was hyper engaging with Austin. He was hyper engaging with myself. He was hyper engaging with Morning Brew. And he applied to be a newsletter writer. Like even still, Toby's not 100% full-time on social media. Wow. Yeah. So, so Toby was hired as a newsletter writer at morning brew. The way that he applied was like how any other writer applies, which is just write, you know, this application, but to, to us, the most telling thing is you have to write basically a morning brew story as a writing assignment. Right. And within a sentence to two sentence, we are able to tell whether this person makes sense That's or not for the role. Yeah. And, yeah. and Toby was one of those people. He was uh, someone who could balance information with storytelling and and tone and yeah. i think cre truly creating edutainment for an audience like everyone uses that word but i don't think everyone is good at it yeah. he was exceptional uh, at it and then i i actually can't remember if he started working on our twitter account right when he started or not but it was just like you started seeing some of the content he was putting out and you're just like he just gets it like yeah. like he has just such an an innate yeah. ability to strike this balance of providing information with uh doing so in a way that other people weren't thinking about it but makes leaves you with a reaction that causes you to leave a reaction on right. the tweet the and drawing and, drawing engagement like but it, but in a healthy way like it, it's it's a it's just being witty i think he he you know um I'm insanely yeah. envious of his, of his, um, yeah, he's gift. amazing. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think the biggest thing for, for him, honestly, in, in developing him is, 
is he has so much ambition. He he wants to grow so fast. And if you think about it, he has grown so fast, right? The Morning Brew Twitter account started 2020 with 20,000 followers. It's at 120,000 followers now with right. no one spending their full-time job on it. For most of the year was Toby spending 40% of his time on it. And so it's pretty remarkable to, th- remarkable to think about. It. And you also think about like how he's become like the social strategist slash guru in the last year. And now he has 16.3 thousand followers after joining the company less than a year ago. That's insane. That's insane. Anyway, um, I, I may uh, have to bring him on the podcast. You know, you yeah. should. He would love it. Um, all right. So. We, we were talking about who inspired you the most in the, in the early days. Yes. So I would say that for me, when I joined the platform, the people that stick out in my mind that I was like, wow, they're incredible at putting out content uh, is David Perel. He was number one. Like I didn't know who David Perel was. The way I originally found out about him was through the articles he was writing on his site. Right read his articles and then just start seeing like the absolute content machine he was. Yeah. And I think he was the first one to codify how like Twitter is an engine for serendipity, right. like how in a lot of ways, Twitter is a better networking platform than LinkedIn is. If yeah. you actually think about the connections that you get through creating content on the platform. Yeah. Um, so I would say David Perel for sure. And then there are other like, not as, not people that don't have as large of followings, but I think that have been really, really good about building in public and to- talking uh, open and honestly. Like one of the people is this guy Dickie Bush. Yeah. So Dickie Bush, like Super not great. a yeah, yeah not a, not a huge following. He has like forty five hundred followers, but he talks a lot about just the con like community uh, writing and growth and what I love about it is like, this is the, what I would say, non-professional side of Dickie, like Dickie in his day job. I'm actually talking to him in like an hour. Yeah, Dickie yeah. in his day. What do you say? He's a finance guy, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Dickie in his day job is an investor at, I think BlackRock, but he, but he just loves creating content and he's like the definition of intellectual curiosity and, yeah. and doing one more thing each day to improve himself. And, and by the way, like that's how you, you had mentioned earlier, uh, atomic essays, the atomic essays that I wrote were through a program that Dickie Bush started called okay. ship 30 for 30. Okay. And I found out about that through following Dickie and just like his ability to share openly on the platform. That's lovely. Yeah. Well, D- D- Dickie is amazing. I, I had a uh, chat with him a few months ago. We had a one-on-one chat and this was before uh, Ship 30 for 30. And he had been saying um, that he wanted to do something in writing as, as a group, as an accountability, you know, uh, group. And then, you know, it was great to watch that come to life through Ship 30. Yeah, he's awesome. So, all right, here's a fun question. Um, how would you define what billing in public is to your mom? I would say... Building in public is giving my mom, making my mom a fly on the wall throughout my day. So literally, if my mom was a a fly buzzing around my office right now, lands on the wall and just sits there for hours, that's what building in public is. It's my mom as the fly on the wall sees everything I see. And obviously, it's not with a... Like, no, there's no way to make building in public 100% transparent. There are things you can't talk about in public that, you know, we could talk more about, but I would say it's an 80% vantage point from a fly on the wall of what's happening with that. No one else sees. Right. I love that. I love that. Um, also shout out to Alex's mom, uh, who, who roasted him for a while on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she's, uh, if anyone wants to follow Stacy Lieberman, she's queen of uh, queen of the brew queen is her handle. Um, and yeah, she's been my chief of staff for a while. She's been involved in the brew for a long time. Like literally in the early days of the brew, she was the person responsible for packing envelopes, packing swag, sending it out, 
writing uh, the the shipping labels for each person. Wow. Um, and it's crazy to think that she was doing that because now we have like literally an entire like like factory that yeah. that does that does it. Um, but yeah, she's been involved uh, throughout, and it's it's awesome. It's it's great to have someone you trust uh, working through your emails and your calendar because it there's just stuff that so only someone you trust can see yeah. and work with. Um, but it's also awesome to see like for her it brings such joy and fulfillment. She's a true founder mom then. Okay, we, we, I certainly hope that she'll watch this episode. If not, I'll make sure that I'll send her a DM. Uh, yep. All right. So another, another, another actually really interesting um, uh, question. I know a lot of people are thinking about this, about Morning Brew and about you. So you encourage a lot of your employees in Morning Brew to build in public as well, which first of all, I think is dope. Um, in what ways do you think it will benefit them and the Morning Brew brand? Yeah. So, I mean, the way I think it benefits our employees is it makes them more marketable in the, in the marketplace. Like to me, the best case scenario, I was saying this to our senior leadership team yesterday, the best case scenario is where the frequency of them being hit up by people for jobs skyrockets. Like yeah. to me, if I can, if I can build with Austin morning brew into a true career accelerator. Um, I, I think we've done our jobs effectively because I think what that means is we've, we have helped to develop great people who add value to our company. And my view is that it's then on Austin and I to like do our part in retaining employees. Right. Um, and by the way, I don't think that just means like paying them more because like, what you find is like, yes, obviously money is important, but also so much of an employee's happiness obviously comes down to things like the mission, the values, their mm -hmm. manager. Do they, do they like their manager? Or do they not? Do they right. like the substance of their work or not? And so and even the the economy, like how much control do they have in, in their, in their uh, job? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so to me, the, the benefit for employees is that it acts as a career accelerant for them. Um, you know, the, Twitter, like your, your Twitter brand, your LinkedIn brand, your Instagram brand. It's like, it's your new resume. It's your new yeah. printout resume. And, and I say this all the time, but I think like having a blue check mark, you know, I, I would take over an MBA any day of the week. Right. And, um, so that's the positive. What is the negative or what, sorry, what's the positive for the business? I think at the end of the day, it's like, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Like when, when we have not just the morning brew handle on Twitter posting, but we have, you know, Devin, our new employee posting on Twitter that she's joined the brew and she doesn't just get a retweet from morning brew, but she gets a retweet from morning brew, Austin, myself, Kinsey, and five other members of the team. Right. It's like one, just purely from a social media, like morning infrastructure brand. perspective, yeah. more people are going to see it. It's also going to make Devin feel more validated in starting right. at the company because it's not just like, oh, like Alex and Austin telling Morning Brew's social manager to retweet her. It's like right. everyone is doing it in their own volition. Um, and, and so I think at the end of the day, it's like uh, the, the example I'll use is, is, um, is Barstool. And while, while not everyone aligns with their content, I think everyone has to at least have an appreciation for their content strategy, meaning you see like how, how much they have just like, they exist everywhere. Yeah. They exist everywhere, not just because of the amount of content they're creating, but because of their ability for all of their personalities to cross promote one another. I right. think what we're doing differently is like, we're breaking the fourth wall and we're not just saying, Hey, Alex, who has founders journal and Kinsey, who has business casual and XYZ personality, who's launching a show in the future, build yourself up. But it's also like, you know, Hey, uh, Jenna and Scott, who are salespeople at Morning Brew, why don't you talk about what it's like to uh, actually be a seller and gr and grow with a sales organization? Right. Hey, Kate, who runs HR and people at Morning Brew, why don't you talk about like how you build an HR team and how you've scaled a company from or scaled with a company from twenty six people to sixty five people? So to me, it's like I haven't seen anyone arm the the rebels on yeah. the non-personality side yeah i mean the the incredible thing is 
everyone, especially a fast growing company, fast growing startup, has an interesting story to tell. Yep. Right? It, it doesn't. I think the 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 uh, the trap is people like immediately imagine that oh my god they're gonna out all the secrets or open the public uh, company. No one's no one's no one's asking to do that. We're yeah. talking about they take your day to day. Look at the five things you do and what are some lessons other people can learn from this. One, that's my style. I know that's your style. Or Toby's style, which is like, what are the five silly things that happen as part of your job? You just have to do it, right? Totally. And that's the witty, that's the funny side. And both of these things work because people want entertainment sort of thing, like you said the other time, the other day. I mean, and and uh, and so to that point, it may, and I don't know if this is one of your questions, but it may just be helpful to talk about like what are the potential downsides of this? Can we get to that? So I have a I have a specific question around it. And it, it says, what do you see as um the downsides of building in public? Because that's a hot question from, from Twitter. Yeah. So I will I will tell you what I think um people say are the downsides, and then I'll tell I'll tell you whether I think they make sense or not. Do you do you want me to prompt you? Because I got four prompts about those four downsides. Yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. Why don't why don't you prompt me? First one, competitors stealing playbooks and plans from you. Yeah. So what I'll say is I think one, people overestimate stealing of things, at least as a media company, right? I can't talk uh, on the behalf of, you know, like a pharmaceutical company or a technology company where like true, like, you know, uh, upfront massive fixed cost IP is needed for a business. So what I'm not talking about are those businesses because I don't know nearly enough to say whether like, you know, talking about that in public would be a mistake. My guess is yes. But what I'll also say is like, I think when when people think about building in public, they think it's zero or 100. Right. Like the, they're, yes. they're, they're, yeah, there, there are things that we are doing at Morning Brew that we're going to be launching in next six months that we haven't talked about yet on, on Twitter. Right. Part, part of it is we, you know, we want, we don't want to talk about it. Like we want to build up anticipation for it. Right. But also the other thing is that uh, we like, we want to make sure it launches and that like things materialize before we set the expectation that right. something is going to happen. But so I think that's the part of it is like, it is a spectrum. People treat building in public as binary. I'm not sharing a hundred percent of what's happening behind the scenes right. of the company. I'm not sharing my conversations with individual employees. I'm not sharing exactly what we're launching each quarter, but that doesn't mean I'm not building in public. And so right. I think that that's a big distinction. Okay. The second prompt I got is, um, while you look dumb or embarrassed or ashamed when what you said didn't work when you said it in public. Yeah, so to me, that's a strength. Like I think that's, I was gonna say that's that's actually a good thing. Yeah, waste that shit. Yeah, I I think I think it's it's first of all, I think people human beings have short memories, yeah. right? So ninety percent of like I I think I think if you go back and you look at Gary Vee's content, right. and I, I love Gary Vee, like yeah. he uh, he's a genius on social. I'm a huge fan. I, yeah. I think if you go back and actually look at all the predictions he's made, like you literally go back in his feed, you'll find so much stuff that he said is probably wrong. Right. And, and I think that's almost one of the beauties uh, for, of social media for people who call things out is it's impossible to find old content or it's like really difficult. You really have to go through the effort of doing that. And so I think it actually creates this, this weird barrier where like people are hooked on your content in the now but not hooked on the things you say right. for a year. Like right. in a year, the things that people will be hooked on what you say are the things you're saying in a year. Right. And by the way, that's like, that is the genius of people who like call thing, like make predictions or make calls is in a year from now, they will call out the two or three things that they were right about and resurface them. And because they will do the work to find their old posts of the things that they were right about. Right. So I think that's one thing is right. like, right. it is that right. people... People like have short memories. They're not going to remember every prediction. Like I'm going to say something on this podcast that is a prediction. Hypothetically, people are not going to be thinking about that a year from now when they're consuming Alex Lieberman's content. So that, that is the first thing. But the second thing is 
to their original point, I don't think it's a bad thing. Like if, if hypothetically, like I actually think just like, you know, Gary V calling out that he called the, the Instagram acquisition before it happened. Like, I think there's equal strength in saying I didn't like, I, I called this, I thought this was going to happen. This was a view of where I thought the world was going. It didn't go there. I was wrong. First of all, by saying you're wrong, it disarms people, makes you more vulnerable. It actually brings you down to earth and you're human. But I think actually there's something fascinating in doing a postmortem, like a, like a decision journal to say, okay, I was wrong, but le less about what happened and more about when I made this decision at this time, when I had this point of view at the time, what didn't I know or what did I not think about that right. now I want to call out? And and to me, that adds texture to like you being a really thoughtful person. Right. Love that. Um, and the final, uh, well, the final prompt is um, that in public doesn't work because the people who show interest in your content um, are not the ones who are paying for your products. Um, okay. So my understanding of this is that the people who show interest in your content well, are not the one... Right, who are part of the brand may not be paying customers, but I think yeah. that's the rise of business, isn't it? It's just like that's funnels. That's just how funnels yeah, work. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was just gonna say. Is like at the end of the day, you know, even if one out of every fifty people that right. are engaging with our build in public content ends up turning into a paying customer, the yeah, the yeah. It, it's good, but also it's the type of thing because our product is a free product right now. It's not one in 50. It's going to be significantly higher because the friction to be a customer is going to morningbrew.com and putting in an email address. Right. And so I, I get, I guess my view would be like, if, if the argument that that's being made there is like, this isn't an effective use of your time, I guess I would ask like, what companies have been around for 50 years that haven't built up their brand? Mm. Like how many companies, how many longstanding companies in the world exist that haven't done a significant amount of work to build top of funnel awareness? Mm. That's an interesting perspective. But there, there, I mean, that, there's not, there's not a lot that can stay that long, right? Yeah. And, and this goes into the question of like, you know, when does it make sense to invest in brand versus not? To me, right now, we're not investing money in, in Morning Brew's brand. We're investing time. Yeah. And I think investing time is is worth it because cheaper. again, again yeah. the 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 ways that we benefit from investing in our brand on Twitter, like people think about it too myopically if they think we're just expecting subscribers. What right. about ad deals? What about potential partnerships? What about learning about new ways to create content that would make us better for our customers? What about hiring? You're getting in yeah. the pipeline of people. Exactly. Hiring. All right. So uh, a couple of questions from the audience from yesterday when we put it out, a uh, question for you. Um, if you were starting fresh with no following popularity, how would you go about building a brand on social today? Yeah, I think... I think what I would do, and 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 yeah. when you ask that question, are you saying, um, are you asking also what platform I would do it on? Um, well, Twitter. But so okay. So from Diego, and so let me free your phrase. If it, if it says if magically everything went away and you were like a guy on Twitter today, brand yep. new, zero, you were like Toby on Twitter today. What would you do uh, about growing a brand? Yep, I would. I would do exactly what Sahil Bloom is doing. Sahil Bloom writing threads. Yep. The man is a machine. Yeah. So uh, I, I did my first thread last week. Balloon I think effect. it led to, it led to 600 new followers. The first thread took me probably three hours to write, but to me, it's like combined building in public vulnerability and being a smarter builder with threads. So for example, a thread that I'm currently working on right now in, by the way, uh, the best website to do threads is chur c-h-i-r-r -R. i'm a paying member i'm paying customer yeah. Get chur, not yeah. That. yeah yeah i love it and That's so for too. example right right now the next thread i'm working on is the art of the speech so it's the art of the speech why are some speeches so much better than the rest why are they so moving so powerful so clear and relatable here are the five keys to a killer speech and so my view is i would create threads that storytell 
and I would um, make it utility or service content. So right. something that you walk away with where you feel like as you're reading it, you're writing your own notes down. Right. You know, th there's also, now that, now that you mentioned um, threads, you know, first of all, I think that's, a, first, that's, that's an open secret. Everybody who is big on Twitter constantly reminds everyone that the way to get followers is either through controversy, right? Or write quality threads. Yeah, now, and people just don't spend the time on it. That's why yeah, I think it's going to continue yeah. to be an opportunity is because right. they take a lot of time and research. Yeah, it does. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip to the, the other question from Regina. Shout out Regina from On Deck. So she goes, how do you feel like building public contributed to Morning Brew success with gaining market share in an outdated industry uh, like news? Of course, so, I think, well, yeah. I want to, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my, my view is I actually don't think it's just a media thing. I think any company should be building in pro public because I think any company needs to be an audience company, you know, even a B2B company. Like I've seen incredible B2B companies build affinity through like creating great content by effectively building media engines. And so what I would say is like we live in a digital age where anyone on, uh, anyone that has internet connection and a device can create content means there's more content than ever means that people expect more custom experiences uh, more than ever. And it means that people expect to hear from other people more than ever. And so to me, it's like, this is, this is our generation's version of just like, I don't know. I'm trying to think uh, of an example, but like in the old days, hypothetically, um, you know, Rockefeller, uh, right. being like the face of Rockefeller's business. It's like what used to be building, bringing a face or a name to a brand by going on radio and the newspapers and TV, nothing has changed. It's just easier than ever to do it. To, to, it. Yeah, to put faces in front of a brand. And so to me, like, I, I don't think... I, don't, I actually don't think it's a new concept, but I think it's just understanding that human beings, like at our cores, there's a few like, just like core needs we have. And one is just like human connection, feeling connected to other people. Like yeah. someone can only feel so connected to a, a logo and a name of a company. Yeah. Someone can feel very uh, connected to a first name and a last name who writes something that you resonate with. And maybe it comes from like our early days when we were cave people and by being connected with other, with other cave people provided us safety. So we didn't get killed by predators, yeah. but it's like connection is, is I would say forever important. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, well, I think we're, um, you know, I'm, I'm almost, you know, at, at the um, end of, you know, the time we have, I want to pause here and um, unwind a little bit. And then, you know, thank you, Alex, for, you know, for some um, helpful answers. Uh, one of my favorite parts about spending time with you is that, you know, you're so authentic. And, um, you know, I, I hope you get this all the time. You should get this all the time. I think it is also another incredible, you know, factor that, is a muscle that I've realized that you, you can develop through building in public is being more and more authentic, you know, because people talk about how they're not able to build deep relationships and they're like, oh, why am I? The answer is, yeah, because you're not being authentic, you know, and when you're authentic, it speaks to the other person, you know, it speaks yeah. to the deeper needs of the other person and you build a connection even in like seconds. Yeah. You know? And what, what else, what I'll say there is like, I think one, it's just like, it takes a lot of work to not be authentic. <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> Like it, it's a, uh, it's, right. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's work to be something tiring. other than yourself. So it's tiring. Yeah. And by the way, I just think like from a business perspective, perspective, authenticity is an unlock for other authenticity, right? Like even in the world in which in business, knowing more information is valuable, like knowing more about other businesses and right. what's happening behind, behind the scenes, right. it, like it's almost like the secret unlock is being authentic and vulnerable. The more I share about what's happening behind the scenes at Morning Brew, what our revenue was last year, what it is this year, what the biggest pain points are, it is, it literally is a magnet for inf like a, a surge of information from others. Right. And authentic information. So yeah, you yeah. get signal over noise, you know, when, when you exactly. do that. 
I think a lot of it is, you know, like you, you get what you put out in many ways. Exactly. So if, if you put out that kind of energy and vibe, you know, you generally are attracting that kind of people, you know, and then partly is the reason why I chose you as the first guest, you know, because it's, it's, it was, it was the vibe that I was getting. And I, this is something that I believe the core of my heart. And it was just a um, easy fit.